we're talking about the relationship between your passion and your work. Uh, so here's Mr. Billionaire himself, Steve Jobs, and he is in the Follow Your Heart camp. So he says, follow your heart and your intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. So Steve is in the Follow Your Heart Club. I think Ken says, follow your bliss. Uh, Oprah, I don't know why I chose billionaires, but whatever, I guess they succeeded somehow. Uh, she's also in the Follow Your Heart Club. Uh, you've got to follow your passion, figure out what it is you love, who you really are, and have the courage to do that. Um, so, you know, pretty interesting, compelling people saying, oh, just follow your heart. However, here's this guy, Scott Galloway, who is really smart. He says, following your heart is bullshit. Find out what you're good at and invest 10,000 hours in it and become great at it. And his point is that by the time you're great at something, then you'll have recognition and pride and monetary rewards and uh, ha happiness will come with that. So he's a little bit on the other side of that debate. And then billionaire number three or four, uh, one of the great lies of life is following your passions. So Mark Cuban is in the Scott Galloway Club of where you put in your effort. Uh, that tends to be the things that you're good at. If you put in enough time, uh, you tend to get really good at it. And that's when happiness comes, really good, being great at something. So you've got really successful people and half say follow your heart and half say that's really bullshit. So I don't know what you're supposed to do. Uh, so then it's like, well, what the hell are we supposed to do here? Um, this is an interesting segmentation. Uh, from a guy named Bill Damon, he's a Stanford professor. He's generally considered the leading authority on um, the psychological development of young adults. And he classifies, he segments uh, young adults in these four, four groups. Uh, dabblers are people who are trying a bunch of things but they don't really have an, an end game or an idea or vision where they're going. Dreamers are people who can talk a big game but they're not actually pulling any triggers and making anything happen. Uh, disengaged, kind of self-explanatory, they're checked out. And purposeful people are, you know, they've got uh, a mission, they know what it is they're trying to do and they're taking steps to get there. So my goal with the book and the talk uh, is to grow the 20%. That's what I'm doing here, I'm trying to grow mm -hmm. that 20%. All right, so what could the relationship between your work and your passion look like? I've created five different uh, pathways. The first is independent, which is your passion and your work don't have anything to do with each other. I think most people are there. You know, it might be 80% of everybody's there. And the, the theme of the book is if you choose that path, you'll be happier and more kind of joyful and productive than if that path chooses you. Uh, but that's independent. The money path is passion smashing. Uh, go make bank and figure it out later. Uh, that was my a &M roommate, not Patrick, the other one. Uh, he just you know, he wanted to be rich. And so he uh, did his MBA at Wharton and went to uh, Morgan Stanley for, you know, many, many years. He's now uh, runs his own investment fund. And he's very wealthy. Uh, passion path, obviously. So there is a path where you follow your heart now. <coughs> and, but there are certain conditions under which that makes more sense than under other conditions. And that's kind of the point of the framework. But that's clearly a path, passion now. Uh, experiment. Hop from job to job within reason uh, to build skills and or capital and or network uh, while you're figuring out what your passion is. You can see how that might make sense. If you don't know what it is and you're young and you think, well, building wealth and skills seems like a good idea, I'm going to hop around a little bit. And then the balanced path, which is what I did. In the balanced path, you invest, you know, X number of years, for me it was like 20, in building wealth and skills and network, and then you switch to following your passion from a point of financial security and significantly enhanced capability, right? So that's what I did. I did the business world for a long time and then I switched over to, to following my passion, which is what I do now. Um, so these are the five pathways. Uh, at the end of our talk, you'll do the little tool and you'll pick one. Um, so how do I choose the right path for me? And so I've been thinking about this since I was here. Um, and the framework that I latched onto back in the day was called Ikigai. Uh, not the coolest name, Ikigai, but it's a really neat concept. It's a Japanese concept. The word means reason for being. And in the Ikigai framework, your reason for being is at the intersection of what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you're good at. If you're good at it, you love it, the world needs it, you get 
pay for it. If you can figure out what's in the middle of the, those four circles, that's your reason for being. And it's specifically about how you spend your time. So in your working years, this is about you know, finding your reason for being in work. When you're retired, it's for finding your reason for being in, in non-work. It's about how you spend your time. The long game. So this, so this is uh, Angela Duckworth saying the same thing. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. She wrote a book called Grit. I uh, highly recommend it. Turns out uh, grit is correlated with lots of uh, positive outcomes, including uh, income. Um, and she has kind of tools on how to increase it. So great book. So it's still not clear, all right, can I monetize a passion? That's interesting, but it doesn't really tell me what to do because when can I monetize a passion? How, how much is enough, right? Can I monetize it a lot or a little? And what do I need? Do I need a lot or a little? So there's another dimension. And, and the other dimension is, is how much. Uh, so I created a little assessment to figure out your, or to quantify your need for financial security. And you'll answer these questions in, in the survey. And so, you know, a lot of these are, are, are obvious. If you're going to have kids, your need for financial security is higher than if you're not. If you want to have a big house versus a small apartment, your need for financial security is going to be higher. Um, you know, do you have expensive taste? Do you want to live in San Francisco, New York, or is Houston okay? And the, the one that, you know, has um, proven a little bit insightful is number eight. It's, uh, I expect I have health problems. Well, if you expect to have health problems, your need for financial security should probably be higher than if you don't expect to have health problems. So something worth considering. So then you can see how these two things are going to come together. Uh, so this is the don't settle framework. The y-axis is can I monetize a passion, and the x-axis is need for financial security, low, medium, high. And so um, just give you an example of how the, pan, the five paths fall out of this. In the upper left-hand corner, and this is the kind of really obvious one, if you can monetize a passion now and your need for financial security is low, well, you should go do that. So that three is for the passion path, right? No brainer. Let's go down here to the uh, this lower right-hand corner. If you can't monetize a passion and your need for financial security is high, you're probably gonna choose one or two. Uh, like two is the money path. It's my need for financial security is high, I can't monetize a passion, well then go make money, right? And the money path is, you know, go be an investment banker or a strategy consultant or venture capital, private equity, hedge fund. Like there's, there's a lot of career paths where you can make shit tons of money um, just by being smart and working hard. Uh, there's also the independent path could make sense down there, which is just your passion and your um, uh, work don't have anything to do with each other. And so it could be, you, you cannot imagine how you can monetize a passion, but you know what it is, and, but it, you can do it on the, on the weekends, right? And so work is just paying the rent so that you can follow your heart on weekends doing whatever you do. Um, experiment, you know, is very prevalent in the don't know, right? So the can you monetize a passion, don't know. Then that number four is the experiment path. And that is go look around, try different industries, try different functions, try different geographies. You'll learn a lot of stuff, you meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, and you know you might be you, you might get struck by lightning someday by finding something that really gets you excited. Uh, people who study passion say it's it's rarely a uh, a thunderstrike moment. It's there is a spark, but then you you dig you dig you dig and you work and you work and you work and you fall in love over time. And finally, let's do the balance path. So the um, so let's say the upper right hand corner or almost to the top, I can monetize a passion, but later, right? I need skills and capital to do it. Well, that argues for number five, the, uh, the balance path, which is I'm gonna work really hard for 10, 15, 20 years, I'm gonna build the skills, I'm gonna save the money, then I'm gonna switch over. And I'm going to follow my passion from a position of relative security. So those are the five paths. This is uh, the framework. So in the book, uh, each of the five paths has a, a chapter on it. The little online assessment tool that you're gonna do has like one page on each of these uh, with kind of the tips and the next steps. Uh, I'm just going to do two of them because it would be boring to do all five. Um, in the last two classes, most people chose the, the balanced path. So I'll go through the, the, the next steps here. One, interview people in careers that you may really enjoy, pay well, and build skills. Uh, and do the truity.com stuff. So I'm a big fan of um, the career interview. There's a, a great book from another pair of Stanford professors uh, called Design Your Life. And they have this kind of template for a career interview. And it turns out when you 
ask middle-aged people to give you an hour over lunch to talk about their work, they quite often will just say yes. Uh, and if you have a nice set of 10 questions, you'll get profound uh, insight from just talking to people who've been there and done that. So just one, just have the courage to do that. Uh, two, be intentional about what you're learning and relate it to the future passion work. So if you, know, if you have in mind the passion you want to monetize 10 years from now, make sure that your balance path work is building what you need to do that. If you have to have a million dollars to follow your passion, you know, make sure you're making money. If it's digital marketing expertise, if it's, you know, process redesign, whatever you think is going to be a key in the passion monetization down the road, make sure you learn that. So be very intentional about what you're learning on a balance path. Three, spend less than you earn. Uh, so when I got out of a and I was constantly building uh, my forecasted savings, like constantly. Uh, so I had a plan, and I was sticking to it. Uh, Scott Galloway likes to say that his parents who are retired are wealthy. Uh, but what they do is they get $60,000 a year in pensions and they spend $55,000 a year. And they always take a vacation and they play bridge and they drink wine and they're really fulfilled and happy and joyful. He says, that sounds like wealth to me. As opposed to his banker friend in New York who makes three million a year. Uh, but after two divorces and three houses, he spends three million a year. So this friend truly uh, stays awake at night worrying about making a mortgage payment and he makes three million dollars a year and he said look that that doesn't feel like a wealthy person to me so it sounds obvious but a low percentage of people do that spend less than you earn four uh you can cultivate potential passion projects on the side so when you're working hard on your balance path and you're putting in your 15 years at hopefully something that uh, you really enjoy and you're building skills and capital you should still play around with your passion projects on the side uh, and five don't switch too soon. So both can be the, the best answer. So for me, um, I was a, a partner at Booz for a few years and CEO of a billion dollar company while running Sherwood Forrester at the same time. Uh, and I was very intentional about that because for the first several years of Sherwood, I wanted to be able to write $100,000 checks to invest in scale. And so I did both. Uh, and while that was hard, I mean, it was a choice that I made. And that kind of, that's my point, because if you make the choice, you're gonna be happier with it and probably be more productive too.